Hi, I'm Keen Washburn. I'm the Student Locations Director here at The River Church. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect. That's one word, no space between the two words. Text River Connect to the number 97000, so 97000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the message today. Well, happy Easter, everyone. Welcome to the River Church. So glad that you are here. If you are a guest with us, thanks for coming to us on, on Easter Sunday, and, and uh, just so glad you chose to gather with us. We, had, we added a gathering today, so at, we had one at nine, and when nine o'clock gathering happened, I went, oh man, everybody came to the nine. I was wrong, because this one's full too. So it was just exciting to see what God's doing in the church. And, and uh, if you have a Bible, we'll be in John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20, but so glad you have joined us. If you haven't been here in a while, we just want to welcome you back. And, and uh, we at the River Church are a place we love the Lord and we love people, and we hope you come and feel loved uh, here. Uh, my name is Jason Combs. I'm the location pastor here, and, and just excited to share with you the Word of God this morning. This morning, I got up really early. We, have a, we had a 7 o'clock, a 9 o'clock, and an 11 o'clock gathering. So I get up early, but I always enjoy getting up early on Easter morning. I love getting up early. It just makes, makes me think. In the Bible, it tells us on Resurrection Sunday, they went to the tomb. It was still dark, and they ran up to the tomb, and the stone was rolled away. And as a believer, as a Christian, this is the most exciting day because Christ died on the cross, but he did not stay dead. He rose again. And as a Christian, this is the most joyous day. Yes, I know every day I should look to the cross and, and look to the risen Savior, but today is just a day as we gather together. If you know the Lord, man, it is a joyous, peaceful Sunday because Jesus died and rose again that we may have life. I find it so fascinating since that date. There's never been a day on this earth, has there? Think about it. Has there ever been a day on this earth since Jesus, right? On the other side of the world, has there ever been a day where that event has not been talked about? Every single day, all over the world, talking about Jesus. The stone rolled away, and Jesus was alive. And so this morning, we celebrate that. We celebrate the peace that Jesus brings. In John chapter 20, the day of the resurrection, Jesus again meets with his disciples. In John chapter 20, verse 19, it says that on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. It says the disciples, those who were with Jesus for those three years, they had all scattered and run away. This has been an awful, awful couple days. They see Jesus beaten and hung on the cross. They are now scared that they're gonna come after them. They are now hiding in a room. And many think that this room that they're hiding in is the upper room. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we have been studying and really uh, analyzing the scripture where Jesus, right before he was betrayed, that night, that night, right before he met with his disciples, he began to share with them what things are going to look like after Jesus dies and rises again. He really sets the expectation of going, hey, if you're going to follow me, this is what things are going to look like. This took place in the upper room. Now, just a few days later, many think they're back in the upper room, except the door's now locked because they're scared. And Jesus shows up. The, the door didn't stop him. Jesus shows up, and the first words we see here are, peace be with you. Peace be with you. 
Verse 20, it says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. What I find so fascinating is if you turn back in your Bible just a page, you turn back to really those last couple words that Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room before he was betrayed. It's at the end of chapter 16. The last verse, he says, I've said these things to you, that you, that in me, you may have peace. Before Jesus goes to the cross, says, I'm saying these things to you, I, I want you to have peace. Jesus dies on the cross. He rises again, and he sees the disciples, and what's he say? The first thing we see, peace. I, I want you to have peace. Peace. Earlier in his discussion in the upper room, before he had gone to the cross, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus offers peace. So the bold question I have for you this morning, everyone here, do you have peace? Your life is their peace. And some of you may be sitting there going, uh, Pastor, have you looked outside lately? Gone onto that thing called Twitter? There's not much peace going on. Turned on the news, you see this, you see these murders and these killings and these fights. Not much peace. And I want to tell you, it's much worse than we think. Our little media bubble only covers certain things. This week, go on there and look up wars that are happening in our world today. Look up conflict. Just put in conflicts in the world today. You'll be blown away. There's more than one or two going on. There's thousands of people, and you can go and look. We, those don't really go on to our news because those are, you know. There's great conflict in this world. There's great tribulation in this world. And Jesus goes, hey, I, I'm offering you peace. Do you have peace? And again, you may look at me and go, uh, if you only knew what was going on right now. My wife and I, my son turned 13 this week. Talk about peace. My son's going to be a teenager, all right, or is a teenager. Uh, but my kid, my boy will be, you know, good. That's, you know. Uh, but um, so my son's birthday this week, I said, where do you want to go out to eat? And so he chose a place, a little restaurant, and we went to this restaurant, and we went and sat down, and... Just a couple tables over, there was a, uh, a lady and a man, and there was three kids, like a, like a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. And the five-year-old had decided to have, like, super meltdown in the restaurant. Not kind of, sort of meltdown. Like, worst of all worst, I'm going to meltdown as a five-year-old. And all of us are in, who are parents, we go, oh, yeah, I remember that moment. Right? You remember? We had to tell Silas, you were in Kroger with mom. You totally melted down. And those, again, those of us who are parents, we look over and go, oh, I'm so sorry. Some of you who are older and you look over there with judgmental, like, oh, bad parenting. You just forgot about your child when he was five. You just forgot. But you're the best parent. Your child never had a meltdown, right? But yeah, we look total screaming, laying on the floor. Like Silas, he stopped staring, son. It's okay, but losing it. Told, hey, uh, he's saying I want ice cream, and she says, no, no, no. We're, we're, you, I told you, you had to behave, and then you could have ice cream. And he's like, I'm gonna behave. <laughs> As he screams. She didn't give in. I was impressed. Now, the, the man sitting there, he didn't move the entire time. Like, mom is working and trying to help. The man does it. Even the expression on his face, he's just like, <laughs> judgmental me. I'm like, dad, you better pick it up. Like, come on. Mom's doing everything. No wonder. No, sorry. All right, sorry. But you got to pick it up, dad. And then I heard something like, hey, all right, tell, tell your uncle goodbye. I'm like, oh, it's the uncle. Poor guy. Like, sitting at the table. What a meltdown. And you may be saying, that's what's going on. There is meltdown happening. Jesus says, I've come to bring you peace. And you may go, no, you don't. 
Like, what are you talking, peace, you should see what's going on. When we study the word peace, we even look at the Jews, they, they use the word shalom, right, that, that greeting. Now, this word peace, it doesn't just mean, I hope you don't have any trouble. That's many times, when you, we hear the word peace, we're like, okay, no trouble. That's, what, that's not what the peace that the Bible talks about. This peace with shalom, what it means is this wholeness, this completeness, this health, this security, even a prosperity in the best sense. If you read the New Testament, if you flip from chapter to chapter, you go from Romans and then Corinthians and then to Galatians and Ephesians, you go to 1 Peter, you go to Thessalonians. At the very beginning of every single one of those books, it says grace and peace to you. There is this peace that is offered. And worse that there not being peace out in the world because we know there's not peace out in the world. And let me tell you, there's not going to be. There are going to be wars and rumors of wars. And what's worse than that is the lack of peace right in our homes and our families and our schools and our job. But Jesus comes and he says, I offer you peace. Now he doesn't just offer, he says to the disciples, I want you to have peace. And then he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. It wasn't some fluffy lie that Jesus was saying, and some churches do that. If you follow the Lord and give enough money, you will just feel good the entire time. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you know me, abide in me, if you have me, you can have true peace, even in tribulation. And so this morning, I want to explain what I believe the Bible tells us peace really is. So let's pray and dive in. Lord, we sure need you. Lord, I pray this morning. May your Holy Spirit move. May our hearts, our ears be open to your truth. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So I believe, as I've studied, there's two parts to peace. The first part is this. Jesus offers you peace with God. Again, peace is more than just absence of turmoil. Our world, how do we try to find peace? Well, it's like, man, if I can just get to Friday night and the kids can be in bed and not screaming and, and they can be in bed and clean and sleeping and I can just be at home and I don't have to see my boss for 48 hours and uh, the basement is no longer flooded. I took care of that. And the Tigers played earlier today, so I won't be stressed out about that. If I can just not have turmoil sitting here, then, then I'll have peace. But the truth is, in the present time, even if there is a lack of turmoil, it doesn't give you peace, true peace. Why? There's still the past. There's still the things that took place. There's still the things that fill our mind and what you did and what you said that you still cringe when you think about it. There's that sin that you did to people, loved ones in your life. There's the sin that people did to you. And you have those scars and those hurts and those wounds. And so you can sit there in the present time and go, okay, there's a lack of turmoil, but it doesn't take care of the past. So what do we do? What, what we do in our culture is we just try to either ignore it, try to just you know, put the blinders up, or we medicate it. We grab a bottle or some pills and think, if, if I can just... Forget about it. Then I'll find peace. But it doesn't bring peace. Why? Because you can sit in the present, try to ignore the past, but it doesn't take care of the future. Because the future's still there and it's still coming. And that's the, there's that worry. What is the future? Then you have kids, you're like, this world with my kid, what, where is it going? And then we start to think, um, well, I, I, uh, I don't know if God really knows what he's doing in the future. And if we don't have the peace of God, then, then after this life, the truth is we don't even know what that eternal future is. But Jesus came, and in the upper room before the cross, he says, I'm offering you peace, 
and he goes to the cross and he dies on the cross and he rises again and he comes up and he says to the disciples, hey, what am I offering? Peace to you. Peace with God. Colossians 1.19 explains it very clearly. Colossians 1.19 says, For in him, for in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Jesus on the cross reconciled some things. It says, whether on earth or in heaven, it says, making peace. Jesus makes peace. Peace with God for us. How? By the blood of the cross. Jesus offers us peace with God. The Bible clearly says, if we don't know God, we are at war with God. The Bible says our sin separates us from God. It even says in Romans chapter 5 that we, without Christ, are enemies of God. And I know that is different to what many of you have heard before. Some of us think, if my good just can outweigh my bad, then I'll get in with God. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says your bad is your bad, and your bad separates you from God. Because God is just. He does not shrug his shoulders at sin. Sin has a punishment. And because of our sin, we have separation for God. We are at war with God. But Jesus, because he loves you, came to bring you peace with God by the cross. Because Jesus took your sins upon the cross. He took the wrath of God upon himself to make a treaty with you and God. So that now when God looks at you, if you know Christ is your savior, the righteousness of God is imputed on you. See, the world, as it tries to find peace, one man said the world bases its peace on resources while God's peace depends upon a relationship. And this piece, this part one of peace is, one one called it the objective piece, meaning this isn't about feelings. This isn't about, well, I I feel this. This is about the fact of salvation. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God only comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why our good works, coming to church enough, giving giving money, it's not gonna make a treaty with God. Jesus in the cross brings us peace. One said, we who trust Christ are redeemed, totally forgiven, and declared righteous by faith. Our sins are forgiven, rebellion ceases, the war is over, and we have peace with God. Here's what the cross did. The cross meets you in the present time. The cross goes to your past sins and forgives them completely. And the cross says, I have a future for you. I've got you. That is peace with God. And if you know Christ is your savior, this is peace with God. Past, present, and future. I love the story of my wife's grandpa coming to know the Lord. He died probably five, six years ago. He was 92 years old. When uh, I was with my father-in-law, when he got a call that, that his father had fallen. And I remember him dropping me off and him taking off to try to go help his dad. And uh, he was in bad shape. It was just a few weeks after that that he passed away. And this happened years ago. I think my son was seven years old, somewhere around there. But my son said to my wife, Mom, does great-grandpa know the Lord? What does he ask? Does great-grandpa have the peace with God? My wife said, I I don't know, buddy. Why don't you call your grandpa and ask him? So my son calls grandpa and goes, Grandpa, does great-grandpa know the Lord? My father-in-law, who's a good godly man, said, Silas, I, I, I don't know if he does. But grandma and I will go see him right now, and we'll go see, 
So they drove to the hospital about an hour away and sat with him and told him about how, they, how he could have, as a 92-year-old man, peace with God. And they came back home that night and called Silas and said, Si, we went and talked to a great-grandpa, but we don't know if he has peace with God. They said, but we're going to call our pastor. Maybe he'll go up tomorrow. So the pastor went up to, to see him, and it was just a few days later that he passed. I'll never forget at the funeral, the pastor got up and said, you know, I went and saw this man days before he died. He said, I told him about Jesus, the weight of sin, and really how he could have peace with God through the cross of Jesus. And he said, just days before he died, he had peace with God. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It wasn't a prayer or a communion or a baptism. It was by faith through the grace of God that he was saved. And the pastor said this. He said, and I asked him right after that, what does it feel like? And great grandpa said, it feels like the weight of the world has been lifted off of my shoulders. This church is peace with God. It is only accomplished through the cross of Jesus. This isn't about a feeling. This is about the fact. This is about the truth that Jesus loves you and he says peace to you, but you must accept me as savior. You must repent of my sin, of your sins because he had no sin. To repent of your sin and to trust him as Lord and savior. This is peace with God. The second part of peace is the peace of God. One man termed it like this. This is the subjective. This is the feeling part of peace. See, in John 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. This is subjective peace. This is in the present time. Jesus doesn't just say, hey, get your eternal life taken care of and then go do what you want to do. He says, no, I have peace for your past, peace for your future, and peace right now. Even in the mess of this world, I offer you peace with me. One said biblical peace. It is a goodness of life that is not touched by what happens on the outside. You may be in the midst of great trial, persecution, adversity, suffering, and affliction of various kinds and still have biblical peace. Yes, we live in a broken world, and that's why Jesus said, yep, there's still going to be tribulation. There is still going to be difficulties and brokenness, but I offer you peace. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. In this present life, God offers you peace. To rule is the word here, the, the Greek word means like umpire. It means the decision maker, the final decision, the final call, the peace can be in your life. Romans 14, 9 says, pursue peace. Romans 12, 18 says, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all. 1 Peter 3, 11 says, seek peace and pursue it. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 says, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace. Quote a man, it says, the peace of Christ is the unending source of strength in the midst of difficulties. God doesn't save you and say, good luck, have fun. God saves you. And then what he said to the upper room, the disciples, and to us, he said, I save you. And now I make my home in you. Now you have the Holy Spirit that gives you strength to have that peace of God. Jesus offers his peace. When Jesus was in the upper room, soon to be betrayed, 
He's then taken and he is beaten. A crown of thorns is put on his head. He's mocked and spit upon and punched. They didn't, they didn't take a whip and destroy him. They didn't throw him before Pilate. And they say, we want him to be crucified. And so he comes before Pilate. Pilate looks at him. Pilate with great power, at least he thinks so. And Jesus responds like nobody's ever responded to Pilate. I, can th- I think probably most people, when they got to Pilate, they got down on their knees and started begging, please, please. Or they got mad and angry and started fighting. Jesus did neither. Jesus stood before him. And it says Pilate is shocked. He's like, he doesn't get it. Nobody has acted like this. Why? Because of the peace of God. Because Jesus knew as he stood before Pilate, this isn't your doing, Pilate. I am laying down my life so I can bring true peace. And Pilate says, don't you know I have the power to free you? And Jesus goes, no, no, no you don't. Jesus could bring angels. He could, he could, it could all end. He could have said, no, I'm done. I'm not doing this. But Jesus willingly and lovingly for your sake and for my sake went to the cross paid the penalty, and he died. But today we celebrate that he rose again, and we may have the peace with God and the peace of God. There's examples throughout the Bible of those who have God's peace. Like in Acts chapter 16, there's man by the name of Paul and his friend Silas. I really like that guy. So Paul and Silas are sharing the good news of Jesus, and they get beaten. They get thrown into jail, and I think probably they're, they're blood-soaked. They, they're just, they've been beaten. They're thrown into jail. In Acts chapter 16, it says in the middle of the night, they began, they began to sing praises to God. I found in church, we don't sing praises when it's not, not the right kind of music. They were beaten. And they began to sing praises to the Lord. The peace of God through the strength of of God, only through the strength of God. They began to sing, and the, the Bible says the earth began to shake, and the doors of the prison opened, and, and the prison guard came running in, and with the doors open, he was going to kill himself because he said, if they come and the prisoners are gone, they'll kill me. And Paul goes, oh, whoa, 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 we're all here? The prison guard looked at him. And the Bible says, he said this, what must I do to be saved? Looked at him and go, how can this, how can you act like this? How in turmoil and in strife and being beaten, how can you still sing? How do you have this peace? Prison guard's like, I, I, how, how, how do I receive that? I pray for our church that we'll be different I feel sad because there's people in here that go, man, I hang out with Christians. They don't have that. That we would be a church that really have the peace of God. That when things happen at work and at home and in school, people look at you and go, you're weird. How, How do you act differently? How is it that you have peace in this mess? So that hopefully it leads them to a place where they go, how, 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 how do I have that? Now, I want you to know, I'm, I'm not a pastor standing up here going, man, I am perfect at this. I am one peaceful guy, smothered with the peace of God. No, no, because I'm really good at going back to my past and going, yeah, God, I know I gave it to you, but I'm going to take it back. I know you've forgiven me of this, but I'm going to take it back. What happens? I lose the peace of God. 
I go to my future and I go, yeah, God, I know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, but I'm not sure you could do it as good as I could do it. God, I, I, I know heaven is my home, and, but I, I just, I'm going to start worrying about this and worrying about this. And that's why Philippians chapter 4 says, be anxious for nothing, but in prayer and supplication, make your request be made known unto God. And then it says, the peace of God shall guard your heart. So guard your heart and your mind. This is a soldier standing there, the peace, aggressively knocking down things that are taking away your peace. This is the peace of God. But I'm so good at picking it back up. Or in my present life, from how I live, I go, yeah, God, I know you tell me that's how I should live, but I think I got it better. And I, I start doing things how I want to do it. What happens? Lose the peace of God. Now, do I lose my salvation? No, I have peace with God because of the cross but as I walk this walk in this present age, I want peace of God as I step and as I walk. That's why I'm so scared for many people. They go, I'm good. I got Christ. I got my past. I got future. I'm all good. But there's nothing of the peace of God and the walk of God in their life right now. And it makes me question, do you know God? One, one man said, said, how do you know a guy is carrying a full bucket of water? because his shoes are soaking wet. How do you know if somebody has peace with God? Because their feet are soaking wet with the peace of God. That the peace of God is in their life. It is not always easy, there is difficulty, there is hardship, but the Lord is so there. My sister called me this week, or I called her, She said, Jay, many of you know my, my dad passed away in December. She said something like, I think back to that. And the peace of God was so amazing. Like even thinking back in that time, dad struggling, man, the peace of God, so real. And even in that turmoil, and she called me, she goes, it's just so different when you're sitting with, your, with, with dad and you know, man, dad is smothered with this peace of God that he is at peace with God. And now we look and go, man, dad's celebrating a pretty good Easter this Easter. Dad is with the Lord celebrating Jesus. So the saying, go in peace, means a lot more this morning to me. I hope all of you this morning go in peace. What I mean, I, I hope you go in part one of peace, that you are at peace with God because you have trusted in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice of the cross that he died and rose again. And I pray you go in pre peace because you have the peace of God on your life. Strengthened, filled with the Holy Spirit. And in this broken and messed up world that isn't going to get better. That you'll know his peace. So this morning... Maybe you're here and the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. You've become honest with yourself. You looked at yourself and say, Pastor, you've talked about this peace with God and I don't have it. I realize I'm an enemy of God. And you can change that today. It is not something you have to do over and over again. It is something where you, if you call out to Jesus this morning, if you will repent of your sins, and what that means is just say, this is, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm turn away from my sin. Jesus, forgive me of my sin, and save me to be Lord of my life, to lead my life now. 
Not me leading, but you leading. Will you save me, Lord? He will. Today can change your eternity if you'll just accept the peace with God from Jesus Christ. If, if that's you, the worship team's going to come and lead us in a song. If you want to accept Christ, we're going to have staff. I'm going to ask deacons and their spouses if you guys would come up here once the worship team leads. And they'll be up here. And if you want to make sure, hey, I don't know if I accepted Christ, but I want to accept Christ, they will show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. But maybe you're in here and you know you have peace with God. You've trusted Jesus. The last year, month, decade, you've been running from the peace of God. And come back to him. You know the world's not going to give it to you. The dollar's not going to give it to you. That relationship, true peace comes through Jesus. Maybe this is a morning just to repent and go, God, I'm sorry for where I've been going. Forgive me of my sin. He will. Draw near to him. What's the Bible said? He'll draw near to you. Enjoy the amazing peace of Jesus. Will you stand with me, please? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning, Lord, I pray that we will go in peace. We sure thank you for the peace that the cross gives. We praise you in Jesus' name.